Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Hall. So we're now back with chapter 12, and we're here in the special census. So what you all will do in this, this part of the chapter is explain the relationship between the senses of smell and taste. They are definitely related. You all will also describe how the sensations of smell and taste are produced and interpreted. Thereafter, you will name parts of the ear and explain the each part. Distinguish between static and dynamic equilibrium. And then you all will describe the roles, the accessory organs of the accessory organs of the eye. And thereafter, you will name the parts of the eye and explain the function of each part. And explain how eye, the eye refracts light. You will then distinguish between rods and cones, discussing their respective visual pigments. Then you explain how the brain perceives depth and distance. And finally, you will describe the visual path. So having done that, the special senses as they are, are senses of smell, taste, hearing, and equilibrium. Don't forget, of course, the sense of sight. So with that, these special sense organs are, are I would say, located within the head itself. So as far as smell goes, we have the olfactory organs and the nasal cavity. As far as taste is concerned, we have taste buds in the oral cavity. And then of course, hearing in equilibrium is located in the ear, and of course the inner ear, and sight by way of the eye. So we'll begin things with kind of application and self -love. So this gets up to mixed up senses and synesthesia. So it states here, the song was full of glittering orange diamond. The paint smelled blue. The sunset was salty, and the purple tasted like a rectangle. One in 2,000 people has a condition called synesthesia, meaning that joint sensation, which your brain interprets as stimulus in one sense to coming from another. This reminds me of a preferred pain in my but this does nothing. What happens is there is a mutation in at least four genes that causes this condition, and is eight times more prevalent in highly creative individuals than the general population, such as in Duke Ellington, the musician. He was a synesthetic as was architect Frank Lloyd Wright, and even the novelist Vladimir Nabokov. So I won't go through every part of this, but please take your time to review this kind of application. From here, we'll get down into the sense of smell by way of our olfactory system. So as smell is occurring, it says the ability to detect the strong scent of in the market, or the antiseptic odor of a hospital, where hospitals are in the lot these days, or even the aroma of a ripe melon, and a thousand other smells, is possibly thanks to a yellowish patch of tissue, the size of about a quarter high in the nasal cavity. So the way I'll say it is, olfaction is quite less acute than many other known animals here on Earth. The human nose. But the same way, it's not a slouch indeed when it comes to the sense of smell. I'm sorry for not telling you. <laughs> Excuse me. So as it happens, there are as many as six million specialized cells that are here to aid in that sense of smell. So as we get here, let's go to the location and structure. So we have olfactory receptor cells. So these cells, as they are, they are known also as being chemoreceptors. So the way in which it happens is they respond to chemicals dissolved in liquids. So the way it happens is they're within what is called the olfactory epithelium, which is made up of pseudostratified cells. And as it is, air enters the nasal cavity, and it makes that quick turn to stimulate the olfactory receptors before entering that respiratory passage below. So the human olfactory epithelium is in a poor position for its job. Hence, of course, while we sniff to draw in more air, superiorly to cross that olfactory epithelium, which, anticipi which intensifies that sense of smell. So as it is, the two chemical senses 
meaning as it is, the two chemical senses function closely together. And ate in the food selection because we smelled the food same time we tasted. So you could say that it would be an approximate 80 to 75 percent, probably 80 percent of the taste, of course, is provided by smell and beat. So it's often difficult to tell what part of the food sensation is due to smell and what part is due to taste. So an onion tastes very, very different if you have your nostrils closed because, of course, you cannot smell it. Similarly, if we have copious amounts of mucus secretions from an upper respiratory tract infection that cover the olfactory receptors, the food may also taste bland. So let's get now to the olfactory organs. So as I stated earlier, the olfactory organs just look like that yellowish brown mass of epithelium that covers the upper parts of the nasal cavity, and it's superior to the nasal concrete, and has a portion of the nasal septum. So I won't say you need to know everything about anatomy. Let's get down to, of course, the, the nervous system. So the olfactory organs contain olfactory receptor cells, which are bipolar neurons, and they're surrounded by those columnar epithelial cells. So those neurons have knobs at the distal ends of their dendrites, and they're covered with hair-like cilia. So the cilia project into the nasal cavity and are sensitive to portions of the receptor cells. So as this happens, this allows us to, of course, sense the smell. And that means that with each of those approximately 12 million olfactory receptor cells, they each have approximately 10 to 20 cilia. Approximately 10 to 20 cilia. So inhaled chemicals, I say. Those inhaled chemicals, as they stimulate the olfactory receptor cells, they're called odorants. And when I say odorants, meaning those that are odorants are things that we are allowed to smell. For instance, there are approximately 400 types of smell gene that are active only in the nose. So as it occurs, those odorant molecules, they enter the nasal cavity and dissolve at least partly in that watery fluid that surrounds the cilia before they can bond to the receptor proteins on the cilia and be detected to things such as flowers, food, and other objects and substances release over at market. So as it happens, the over molecule binds to those receptors, and it's approximately 400 different types of olfactory membrane receptors that are part of the olfactory receptor cells, and then it depolarizes these cells, yes again, the nerve impulse, and these cells thereby generating potentials if the depolarization if that depolarization reaches that threshold. So this is how olfaction occurs. So it's amazing how these chemicals called odorants can cause such. And we as humans can distinguish, it says, one trillion or so odors, but our olfactory sensory neurons are simulated by a combination of more limited number of olfactory qualities. So it's very amazing how this occurs. So from here, it gets to olfactory pathways, and I'll hit that very briefly. This shows the figure from the textbook. This is figure 12.5. And as it's there, it shows the nerve fibers within the olfactory bulb. It also shows the cilia. And if you look very closely, those are those olfactory receptor cells, the bipolar neurons that are. Amongst, of course, those columnar epithelial cells in the cribriform plate. So this is how olfaction occurs. And to the right-hand side in B, 12.5 AB, you there see the olfactory area as it's associated with the superior nasal conch. So there it is. So as I mentioned, the olfactory pathways, as an odorant does travel inside and cause a nerve impulse to be elicited. It then goes from the olfactory nerve to the olfactory bulb to the olfactory tract to that limbic system, which is why my son now says, Ew, pee, you, and finally to the olfaction cortex for us to interpret the smell. That, of course, will be sense. So, what I'm saying now is about the limbic system itself. I would say you all know a lot about the limbic system. In saying this, it's the limbic system that's similar for memory and emotion, 
and all of which providing that emotional response to those other markets. For instance, you may have been in the mall one day, hopefully no day soon to the day. But one day before, I may have smelled what is called, I suppose, a pretzel of sorts. Maybe a little bit of cinnamon. The smell that you may have had. Or even to smell a pizza, if ever you've had pizza before. I think you all have had pizza. But it's all because of that limbic system. The center for memory and emotion that gives us the emotional responses. The things we do indeed smell. So I'm saying it this way because it's the brain by way of the dying suffering, that center for memory and emotion. That is why we, we may become a bit of nostalgic over a sin from the past. I know you all are by and large younger than I am, but I remember cool water. For those of you who are near my age, or my age or better, you know about cool water. You know that smell. Or even uh, maybe young men who are my age, with that Michael Jordan scent. I mean, that stuff is some of the best stuff on earth when it comes to smells. And of course, the nostalgia than that. So it says that a whiff of the perfume that someone used to wear may also have been a flood of memories. I guess I'll say that, that uh, the person used to be with, the person you still are with now, smelling that scent that he or she may indeed wear. So as I stated this way, its input to that limbic system is also why in which odors can alter mood oh so easily. So the scent of a newly mown piece of hay, or even, of course, rain on summer's morning, can generally make a person feel good. Meaning say, hi, it's now springtime, <laughs> even though it now feels like summer. So having all of this is that main interpretation area, meaning of the olfactory cortex, deep within our temporal lobes, at the base of the frontal lobes, and it's also anterior to the hypothalamus. I know you all haven't been taught the brain yet, but we'll get to the brain here. We'll get to the brain here. So as far as olfactory stimulation is concerned, it's not wholly spelled out how those stimulated receptors encode specific cells, smells, excuse me, specific smells. But the hypothesis is that each olfactory receptor cell has many copies of one type of olfactory receptor membrane protein, but that receptor protein combines with several types of odor molecules. And I'll leave it at that. I don't want to get into so much of the simulation here, because I've made the test and I know what's on the test. So from here we get down to the sense of taste. And if you're like me, I say, you've got to have taste. So when I think of taste, I think of those gustatory cells, or even gustation, that sense of taste. So as it occurs, taste buds are special organs of taste, and they look like, it says, orange sections on the surface of the tongue with tiny elevations. So I call those elevations papillae. So what I'm getting at is, is we have our taste buds, and it's approximately 10,000 taste buds, and they're located on the tongue. So a few taste buds are also scattered on that soft palate, of which there are also some on the inner surface of the cheeks, the pharynx, and even our epiglottis of the larynx, I say air only, and but most of which are found in the papillae. These are those peg-like projections on the tongue mucosa that make the tongue surface look slightly abrasive. Slightly abrasive. So the taste buds are located mainly on the tops of those mushroom, mushroom-shaped, fungiform papillae. So we have a number of papillae. So we have those that are called fungiform papillae. They're over and scattered across the entire tongue surface, and then the and then the epithelium of the side walls of the foliate papillae, and then the large round valate papillae. So the valid papillae are the largest and least numerous papillae. So we have only about 8 to 12 of those, and they form an inverted V at the back of your tongue. An inverted V at the back of the tongue. And you can imagine if you were to look closer at figure 12.7, it would be at the very back of the tongue. So the valid papillae would be back in this area here, forming that inverted so that, of course, shows you the papilla at which we find our taste buds like. So as it occurs, we'll now get to taste itself. We have taste receptors happen again. So each taste bud includes a group of modified epithelial cells called taste cells. I mentioned earlier, those gustatory cells. So those gustatory cells function as, again, here we are with sensory receptors. So those taste receptors 
even though they function here as those sensory receptors. They're also, as it states in your text, a functional sensory receptor. So in this case, I'll call those, meaning taste receptors, functioning as chemoreceptors. And I say, yes, taste receptor and uh, taste receptor, and I also say chemoreceptor. As I say all of this, those taste cells have vesicles that contain a neurotransmitter. So interwoven among those taste cells is a network of sensory fibers, and with that, each of those, approximately 10,000 taste buds, has 50 to 150 taste cells. So the entire structure of a taste bud is, is spherical with a taste pore on a free surface and with microvilli called taste hairs. So, having done that, the sense of taste derives from food molecules that bind to specific receptor proteins embedded in those taste hairs. So, in response to taste, it releases a neurotransmitter that alters the membrane polarization. And there it is again, another nerve impulse. So, with taste being as it is, keep in mind that those taste cells are replaced every three days. Now, why on earth would those taste cells be replaced about every three days? I would say it's because of what we do. We eat. Sometimes you drink hot coffee. Sometimes you, of course, bite into that hot pizza. You just can't wait. Then, of course, your mouth gets burned. Or even hot. So keep those things in mind. Or even hot chocolate. Depending on what time with you. But that is why, of course, they're replaced because a lot goes on in your mouth. So the degree of change in polarization is directly proportional to the concentration of the stimulating substance. As I say it this way, a sufficient stimulus triggers a nerve impulse, that meaning it reached threshold, and of course it's conducted to the brain. So a particular taste results in a pattern of specific taste receptors that bind to a particular food molecule. So I'll put it a way that makes it, I hope, to be the most blunt. The way in which you taste is by a chemical being dissolved. I repeat, that chemical must be dissolved in saliva, which is that watery fluid that surrounds the taste bud. So your salivary glands supply this food. And to, to get this home, think about it and try this. The importance of saliva, meaning by blotting your tongue dry to taste some dry food. And then, of course, repeat this very same test after moistening your tongue, after moistening your tongue with saliva. Having done that, you will definitely feel the difference and see the difference. So I've now moved on over to page 456 with taste sensations. Mm. So taste sensations. These taste cells, as they are, they look alike microscopically, and it looks to be a lot of them. However, they can only sense what is called that, that five types of tastes. So each type is each type is most sensitive to a particular type of chemical stimulus. And of course, the different types of taste buds provide the at least five primary tastes for those five primary gus gustatory sensations. So here they are. The five primary taste sensations are as follows. I call them sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. I'll begin with that. That is called sweet. Things that taste sweet, typical of which for those that are sweet, is because they are illicit. Sweet taste is illicit by many organic substances, including sugars, sugars, excuse me, saccharin, yes, alcohols, some amino acids, and some lead salts, such as those found in lead paint. So I don't know what, what, what you, uh, I guess I'll say where you live. And it's not my business where you live, but just make sure if there's any lead paint around, please put it away so that no one tastes it. And particularly I'm referring to young, young children. And if it happens to be any, I would say, please remove it or encapsulate it appropriately. So getting back to sweet taste. Those sweet receptors are stimulated by those carbohydrates, but, few, you know, but a few inorganic substances, such as, as I just said, the salts of lead and beryllium also elicit taste sensations that are sweet. So next up are those for the sour tastes. So sour taste is elicited or produced by acids, specifically their hydrogen ions in solution. So the intensity of a sour sensation is roughly proportional to the concentration of hydrogen ions in the substance being tasted. 
This goes all the way back to basic chemistry, when you were taught inorganic chemistry. That, of course, pH is of more than a hydrogen ion concentration, so the greater the number of hydrogen ions, the more sour it shall taste. Up next is salty. So salty taste is produced by metal ions, those inorganic salts. Table salt, sodium chloride, tastes the saltiest. So as it states, those inorganic salts simulate the salt receptors, and the quality of the sensation that each salt produces depends on the type of positively charged ions it releases in the solution, such as the sodium ions from table salt. I'm now down to bitter taste. With bitter taste, it is, elic it is elicited by alkaloids, such as quinine, nicotine, oh boy, caffeine, really? Yes, caffeine, morphine, and strychnine, 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 strychnine. So what I'm getting at here is there are a number of other non-alkaloid substances such as aspirin, but they are all bitter. So as they are being bitter, it's those inorganic salts, of even, mag even magnesium and calcium that produces bitter sensations too. And extreme sensitivity to bitter tastes is also inherited, which is why diet colas taste sweet to some, but are bitter to others. Up next would be that is called you mummy. So I say you mummy because it's known as the delicious taste. So a subtle taste discovered by the Japanese estates and elicited by amino acids glutamate and aspartate, which appear to be responsible for that thing called the beef taste. The beef taste of steak. So if you like steak, you indeed love and enjoy the yumami tastes. It also is elicited by what is called monosodium glutamate. So the characteristic tang of aging cheese and that flavor of food added. I can't stress enough that MSG would make food taste so amazing. So please, read your labels to know whether or not it tastes good or it's just the enhanced, I mean that flavor enhancer called monosodium glutamate. So it's used in many prepared foods from glutamic acid which also just stimulates those umami receptors. It's in the name, glutamic acid. So with this, it's been stated that there may possibly be a sixth taste, which of course gets to why we like fatty foods. So maybe there'll be more on this a bit later. So keeping all of this in mind, what I'll state now is, is that Tastes as it is, even with taste for spicy foods, may simulate a class of pain receptors. And each of the flavors that we do taste, they result from the primary taste sensation or a combination of those five primary taste sensations. And taste receptors undergo a rapid adaptation, so once you taste this, your senses, of course, can then thereafter become adapted to such sensation. So taste dislikes and likes have homeostatic values. You know, I'm going there. So your mummy guides the intake of proteins. And the liking for sugar and salt helps the body satisfy the need for carbohydrates. Such as, and of course, those things that taste sweet. And minerals, such as those amino acids. And many sour or natural acidic foods, such as oranges, limons, and tomatoes, are rich sources of vitamin C and essential vitamins. An essential vitamin it is, excuse me. So on the other hand, those intensely sour tastes who warn us of spoilage. Yes, such as spoiled milk. And likewise, many natural poisons and spoiled foods are bitter. Consequently, our dislike for sourness and bitterness are most definitely protected. So now let's go get into taste physiology. So I can't stress enough, for a chemical to be tasted, it must be dissolved in saliva, and thereafter diffuse into a taste pore and contact those gustatory So it says taste transduction. Really quick like. Impulses from taste receptor cells travel on fibers from three different cranial nerves. So cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, nerve 9, and then thereafter the vagus nerve, verse 10, nerve 10. So from that, those cranial nerves conduct the impulses into the medulla oblongata. Those impulses then go to the thalamus and they are interpreted in the gustatory cortex in the insular portion of the brain. This has been case.
Next of which, I'll get into other influences of taste. So yes, taste is 80% smell. So when you have nasal congestion, that blocks your olfactory receptor, your food tastes bland. So without smell, that morning coffee that I enjoy would of course lack its richness and simply taste bitter. So the very same way, our mouth contains stomoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, and nociceptors. Not to mention, of course, the temperature and texture of food can enhance or detract from the taste. So hot foods, such as that from a chili pepper, bring about the pleasure effects by exciting pain receptors in the mouth. So please keep these in mind as we get through taste. Also, please make sure you all review clinical application 12.3 about smell and taste disorders. And see table 12.3, which gets to the loss of sensation, smell, colonosmia, the diminished sensation, a heightened sensation, and that distorted sensation. Please see those for both smell and taste. I'll now get to what is called the sense of hearing. So the outer, well, let me go backwards. I want to go to the outer ear first. Let's get to the sense of hearing. So that ear is our organ for hearing. Uh, that's likely a bit odd. So the ear has an outer, external, and internal, or inner, ear section. And in addition to making hearing possible, our ear also provides and serves us with that sense of equilibrium. So at first glance, the machinery for hearing appears to be very, I guess I'll say, crude. Meaning the fluids must be stirred to simulate the mechanoreceptor of the ear. Nevertheless, our hearing apparatus allows us to hear an extraordinary range of sound and our equilibrium, our balance receptors, continually inform us of the nervous system, of the movements of our head, and the position of our head. Although the organs serving these two are structurally interconnected within the ear, their, their receptors respond oh so differently to stimuli, and activated independently of one another. So let's get to the ear. So as that ear is divided into the external ear, the middle ear, and the internal or inner ear, it is the external and middle ear that are involved with hearing only. I see again, it is the external as well as the middle which are involved only in hearing. Rather, this, I guess I'll say, the inner ear functions in both hearing and equilibrium. So it is extremely complex the way it happens and occurs. So look at what is called in your textbook. Figure 12.9, and I say figure 12.9a. Look for that photograph to be on your final exam. I say again, look for figure 12.9a, shown to you here, to be found on your final exam. The outer ear. So in the states, we have what is called the oracle. It's that outer funnel-like structure. Thereafter, we have this S-shape, external acoustic meatus. And I learned it as the external acoustic auditory meatus, but of course, it's no more the same. Thereafter, we have the tympanic member, or what is also known as the eardrum. So, all of these things, of course, make up that external or out of ear. So, the external acoustic meatus is lined with ceruminous glands. Keep in mind that your ceruminous glands secrete cerumen. And of course, this external acoustic meatus also carries sound to your eardrum, your tympanic membrane. And of course, it stops, meaning the external acoustic meatus stops at that tympanic membrane. So, as that funnel shaped pinna or oracle of the ear funnels and collects sound waves, taking them to that middle ear, that tympanic membrane is what vibrates in response to those sound waves to ensure that you all. Can hear it. And of course, the ensure that I can hear as well. So if you look closely, we'll now get to figure 12.9. And I say figure 12.9 because it begins to show you all the inside of the ear with our three auditory ossicles. So the major part of the ear. So in B, it shows you all those auditory ossicles and each of those one, two, three bones can fit right there on a penny. So let's go to middle ear. 
with a middle ear, we have what is called the tympanic cavity, which is an air space in that particular bone. We have those three ossicles, those three tiny bones, the auditory ossicles. They're known as the incus. They're known as the incus. The stapes. The stapes. And the malleus. The malleus. So these three bones are what vibrate in response to that inflection, the vibration of the tympanic membrane. And that, of course, is what amplifies the force. So they can also be called the hammer and the land stirrer. But this is the way in which you are here by using this bone. So as I have it here, that external acoustic auditory meatus, it passes into that temporal bone, and in this opening we have hairs. The hairs guide and guard the tube, and then the opening and tube are lined with the skin that has many modified sweat glands, known as suminous glands which secretes sermon. Let's call it earwax, you all. Earwax. So the hairs and wax help to keep things that should not be in the ear out of the ear. You say, what things? Things such as insects, I said. So there are two types of earwax that there could be. One that is a wet type and one that is a dry type. The dry form is gray. And the wet form looks to be about of a, I guess you say a brown color or even a, a golden color. The difference in that is by a single base in DNA. That single base, of course, is what determines whether your earwax is the wet or dry type. As the vibrations are transferred, they produce sound, meaning that sound, by way of those vibrations, it travels in waves, such as you would see ripples at the beach or even in a pond upon throwing a rock. So the higher the wave, the louder the sound. The more wave per second, the higher the frequency, or even the pitch. Or so just as vibrating strings on a guitar or reeds of an oboe provide the sounds of those musical instruments, vibrating vocal words like oh, oh, and the larynx provide the sounds of the human voice. Yes, I did that. And lastly, the oracle of the ear is what collects those sound waves directly from inside. So once, of course, every, every bit of this has entered into, we're now into the middle ear. So in the middle ear, I mentioned the ossicles. So those bones are there to transfer those vibrations, as I earlier stated. So when that happens, the tympanic membrane vibrates, the malleolus vibrates in unison with it, and the malleolus will vibrate the incus, and that movement will then pass into the stapes to an opening in the wall of that tympanic cavity. And this is called the oval window. So vibration of the stapes, which acts as a piston in the oval window, transports, transfers, excuse me, the vibration to a fluid within the inner. So these vibrations of the fluid stimulate the hearing receptors. Yes, we are finally hearing them. So getting into tympanic reflex, what happens here is, because those ossicles are transferring those vibrations, as they pass the tympanic membrane to the open window, it's those ossicles that transfer those vibrations, which causes the large surface of that tympanic membrane to form, well, in that much smallest area of the open window. And that force strengthens the travels from that outer to your ear. As a result, the pressure, and it's pressure per square millimeter, that the state supplies at that oval window. So it's about 20 times greater than the sound waves that exert on the tympanic membrane. So the middle ear also has two small light filter muscles, and they're known as the tensor tympani and, of course, the sapedius. Those muscles are the effectors in the tympanic reflex. So those contractions that occur during loud sounds is to lessen the transfer of vibrations to the inner ear and prevent damage of the hearing receptor. You gotta have those. Now I'm getting on down to the tympanic reflex. So as it reduces that pressure from those loud sounds to ensure that damage does not occur to our hearing receptors, ordinary vocal sounds also elicit tympanic reflex, such as when a person speaks or sings. So next up, I'll get to the auditory tube. 
or eustachian tube, as I learned. The eustachian tube connects the middle ear to the throat. This is why there may have been infections in you as a young boy or a young girl. So this tube allows air to pass between the tip of the cavity and the outside of the body boil the throat, specifically the nasopharynx, and then to the mouth. So it, it helps to maintain equal air pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane. And this is necessary class for us to hear and to, of course, hear well. The function of the auditory tube is noticeable when you have rapid changes in altitude. You're saying, what do you mean? Well, for those who have flown, as you descend from a higher altitude, the air pressure on the outside of the tympanic membrane is increasing and may push on that tympanic membrane inward. That may, of course, cause hearing to be impaired. So when the air pressure differences on the sides of the tympanic membrane is great enough, some of that air is forced, forced up through the auditory tube into the middle ear. So th this equalizes the pressure on both sides, which moves back to its rhythm position, and this restores normal hearing, and is why you may have that popping sound as you all have flown. So a reverse movement of air ordinarily occurs when a person ascends. It goes the other way around. And the popping shall also ensue. So the eustachian tube, or the auditory tube, is usually closed with valve-like flaps in the throat, which inhibit air movements into the middle ear. For those following me, what then happens, of course, is by yawning, or even swallowing and chewing, they aid in opening the flaps to hasten, to quicken the equalization of pressure. The middle ear infection. A sign of otitis media in a toddler include irritability, fever, and tugging on that painful ear. So using the autoscope, it can reveal the red bulging tympanic membrane. So as I state this, I'm looking for this in our presentation. And I don't see it. This is clinical application 12.4. I'll keep going. As it happens, the ear infection is because of the mucous membranes that line the auditory tubes are continuous with the linings of the middle ear. That enables the bacteria infecting the throat or the nasal passages to reach the ear. So the bacteria that's commonly there is called Streptococcus pneumoniae or Haemophilus influenzae or Moratilla catahalis. This route to infection is greater in young children because the auditory tubes are shorter than those in you and me in adults. So acute otitis media is treated with antibiotics, but these might not be prescribed at, the, at first for a child older than two years who is not in pain. It's because such infections tend to clear up on their own in the days. In the event that there, there is reoccurrent otitis media class, there might have to be surgery to fit the effective ear with tympanostomy too, to lower the risk of hearing loss. Tube drains the ear through a small hole in the tympanic membrane. So the tubes have been placed in the ear of my son because, of course, recurrent ear infections. The middle ear infections class, as they here, can cause hearing loss in him or her. The inner ear. So the inner ear is made up of that system of a labyrinth. So the two types are, in fact, the bony labyrinth or osseous labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth. The bony labyrinth is a cavity within the temporal bone, and the membranous labyrinth is a tube of the similar shape that lies within the bony labyrinth. So between the two, meaning between the bony and the membranous labyrinths, is a fluid called paralymph. The paralymph is created by cells in the wall of the bony labyrinth. So in the membranous labyrinth, there was a slightly different fluid. This fluid is called the endolymph. So we have two fluids, the paralymph, and the endolymph. So as I've mentioned both of which, I'll say the paralymph is a fluid that's similar to our cerebral spinous fluid, and it is also continuous with it. In the very same way, we have the endolymph, which is chemically similar to a potassium-rich intracellular fluid. So these fluids conduct sound vibrations involved in hearing and respond to chemical forces occurring through rapid changes in body position acceleration. In other words, we're now getting into not just how you all hear, but also 
equilibrium. So I now get to the three parts of the, the labyrinths. I'll begin here with the three regions, the vestibule, the semicircular canals, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. The vestibule. So we have this bony chamber, and it's between the cochlea and the semicircular canals. It's involved, I repeat, the vestibule. It's involved in both hearing. The vestibule class, I say, is involved in both hearing and equilibrium. Up next, I'll get to what it's called. The cochlea. So as I get to the cochlea, what I'll say about that cochlea is it's a tube which is widest at its base and gets narrower and narrower at its apex or top. So what happens with the cochlea is that it's involved in allowing you all and allowing us to hear. Hence, of course, you may have heard of him or her class having a cochlear implant. You may have heard of it before. So I can't say it any further than the way I've stated it, because I, I'm not going to give you every piece and part of that textbook. But do keep in mind that it is involved in hearing. It's a spiral organ. It's a spiral organ with a cochlear duct involved in hearing. And I'll go back and say that the vestibule is there. Even though your textbook says that it's involved in equilibrium, the vestibulum is involved in equilibrium. And now on to finally the semicircular canals. So the semicircular canals, as it states, they fu function in what is called static equilibrium. As opposed to the dynamic equilibrium you found by way of the vestibule, meaning your head position relative to gravity and linear acceleration, well, those semicircular canals are here for equilibrium in the event that there is rotational acceleration or angular acceleration. So it says, uh, clinical application 12.5. There was a little boy that probably lost his hearing when he suffered a high fever at eight weeks of age. I can't stress enough, if ever you have a child, please monitor their body temperature. In the event that he or she has a fever at a young age, such as it says here, eight weeks of age, that gets to be too high. There could be very, very deleterious effects. Stated that way, it states that when he was nine months old, he still didn't babble like those of around his age. His parents suspected that he might be deaf. Deaf. With hearing aids, he did well at a preschool for the deaf. When his parents read about the cochlear implant, a device that does not magically for hearing, but enables a person to hear certain sounds. So unlike that hearing aid that amplifies sound, that cochlear implant directly stimulates the auditory nerve. So at the age of three, he received his implant. And before, before three is the best time because the brain is still rapidly processing speech and hearing as that person masters language. So please, if you have children, talk to them. Talk to them. Talk to him. Talk to her. Embrace it. Because they are learning as they, of course, look into your eyes and listen to everything around them. So what I'm getting to next is, of course, as the person's master that language, some children who receive the device is only one year old. However, even in people who lose their hearing as adults, they can still benefit from those cochlear implants because they link the sounds they hear to that device and, of course, to memories of what sounds were like. And of course, using clues for the senses. So the implant is placed with part of it un inserted under the skin above the ear and leads to two dozen electrodes placed near the auditory nerve in the cochlea. So a headset includes a microphone lodged at the back of the ear, picking up incoming sounds, and a fanny pack containing a speech processor that digitizes the sound into coded signals. So I won't read everything about this to you. What I will say is, is as those devices became available in 19 1984, it states that approximately 325,000 people worldwide have received those implants. So I would hope that in the event that you ever need it, you can use what you just learned about the cochlear implants. So I'll now get to what is coming next. And let's get into it states here.
Well, I've already gone through the cochlea and the cochlea duct. But what's different now is how we get to sound. All right, so it states the spiral organ, or the organ of cruelty. So this contains hearing receptor cells. So what happens here, those receptor cells, called those hair cells, have many hair-like projections on as stereovilli. So I'm saying this is because we have a base of the membrane that extends from the cochlea and forms the floor of the cochlear duct. So when those vibrations enter the paralymph at the oval window, they travel across the scale of vestibuli and pass through the vestibular membrane to enter the endolymph in the cochlear duct. So they then move to the base of the membrane to just mention, and the vibrations into the paralymph of the scalar tympani, and the movement of the membrane covering the ground window dissipates the force into the air of the tympanic cavity. So I say that to get back to here. Those stereovilli, which I learned as stereocilia, they extend into the endolymph of the cochlear duct. And above these hairs is a tectorial membrane attached to the bony shelf of the cochlea and extends like an overhang above those cells. So I'm getting to this because what we're getting to now is those hair cells. So what happens with those hair cells is they begin to bend. As they are bending, it's because of those vibrations. So when information reaches the ultimate centers of the temporal lobes, we hear, and it's all because those hair cells similar to those inputs on the fibers of the cochlear nerve. So the hair cells of this mechanism, mechanism makes more sensitive at, I mean make this mechanism more sensitive at low sound volume. So those stereocilia of the outer hair cells are anchored to the tectoid membrane above it. So in response to very low volume, they pull down that membrane closer to the stereocilia. And this makes, of course, stimulation of those hairs more likely causing the inner hair cells to be more responsive to quieter sounds. The basilar membrane, that basilar membrane, as I state, is stiffer and narrower at the base of the cochlea compared to the apex, where it's more flexible and wider. So with different frequencies of vibration, they move into different regions along the length of that basilar membrane, which I have for you all to see here now. And at, other, and at other frequencies, they activate the receptor cells elsewhere along the cochlea. So if sound activates receptors at different places along the base of the membrane, simultaneously, you hear multiple tones at the same time. And that's, of course, I say why you all likely like songs. So the greater deflection in the base of the membrane, hairs, they push upward against the tectoral membrane, the louder the sound. So just don't forget that we have this all or none phenomenon. So what I'm stating is, is as long as there's a nerve pulse, meaning the more intense the stimulation of the hairs, the more active potentials per second, the louder the sound we perceive. So it won't change. We'll still go from that negative 70 to that positive 30 millimeters. This is, of course, more and more frequent. Well, hearing receptors, there are, of course, epithelial cells, but they res respond to stimuli like a neuron would. Like a neuron. So the ear of a young person, normal hearing, can detect sound waves with frequencies varying from 20 to 20,000 or more vibrations per second. The range of greatest sensitivity for us is about 2,000 to 3,000 vib vibrations per second. So I'm saying this to get into the way in which we can hear those different sounds. In other words, we're getting into the properties of sound. So units are known as decibels. They measure sound intensity, and it's on a log logarithmic scale. So the decibel scale begins at zero decibels, which the intensity of sound is least perceivable. Well, I'm sorry, at least perceptible by normal humans here. And of course, the sound of 10 decibels is 10 times more intense as that least perceptible sound. So the sound of 20 decibels is 100 times as intense as the sound of 30 decibels.
and the sound of third decibels will be 1,000 times as loud, and so on and so forth. I'll just get to the exam. To the exam. A whisper has an intensity of about 40 decibels, and a normal conversation has a, 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 a normal conversation has an intensity of an approximate 60 to 70 decibels, and heavy traffic produces about 80 decibels. From this music on devices, you, you, using your earbuds, exposes the ears to the approximate 110 decibels. The sound class of 120 decibels, such as a rock concert, produces a discomfort, and the sound of 140 decibels, such as a jet plane taking off, causes pain. I'll put it this way to make all those decibels make sense, class. Is that here on page 465? Frequent or prolonged exposure to sound. Sound intensity above 90 decibels can cause permanent hearing loss in you. Please keep this in mind. Now I'll get to those auditory pathways. What I'm just showing you here, class, is the way in which it occurs. The cochlea branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, then onto the medulla oblongata. From there, Move on to the midbrain, so that the medulla oblongata, by way of that vestibular cochlear nerve, the midbrain. The midbrain class will be past the pons, which is there. And from there, we get on into the thalamus, the little white part that is there, and ultimately to the auditory cortex of that temporal lobe. Those are the auditory pathways. Hearing loss. In you. About 8% of people have some degree of hearing loss. That may sound small, but it's a lot of people. There are many factors that can impair hearing, including interference with conduction of vibrations to the inner ear. It also states that's called conductive deafness. Yes, 95% of cases of hearing loss are simply conductive deafness. So that's interference with conduction of sound vibrations to the inner ear. Or it could also be auditory nerve, be due to the auditory nerve and its pathway, called sensorineural deafness. So as I say it that way, that would be, of course, damage to the nerve pathways, the vestibular cochlear nerve, or even the cochlea itself. So this can cause those long-term exposure to very loud sounds. Be the, excuse me, the cause could be long-term exposure to those very loud sounds, such as a factory noise, loud, loud, loud music, explosions. From those who may have served. If you have served, I thank you for your service. So what I'm getting at is, is it could also be caused by a tumor from the central nervous system. That, of course, caused brain damage, meaning the tumor would, but the brain damage that results from the stroke or certain drugs. So I've said all of that because there are 100 different forms. Well, there are more than 100 different forms of inherited deafness, and many are part of syndrome. So one cause of deafness that's conductive is wax buildup. I did say that. One time, I was in college. And what happened was, is I couldn't hear too well out of that ear. And I tried and tried and tried and tried, and ultimately I ended up, of course, at an ear, nose, and throat doctor. I tell you, once the doctor was finished with a little cup in that warm water, I would have thought I was hearing things from the future. It was amazing. And then one of my... I guess he wasn't a roommate, but the, the gentleman that lived next door to me says, he said, Huff, I could have I could have shot some hot water in your ear for hundred up for a hundred bucks. What I'm getting at, of course, is it's it's conductive deafness. Another cause could be a foreign object wedged in the ear. So it plugs up that acoustic nasus and changes the tympic membrane and or the way in which those ossicles, those auditory ossicles, so it can block hearing. The tympic membrane can also harden as a result of disease and become less responsive to those sound waves. Or, of course, it just may be an injury to tear it or make it, of course, become perforated. And then lastly, sudden pressure changes or even very loud sounds and infection or a sickening object in the ear may rupture the tympanic membrane. So please make sure you all read about the common disorder called autosclerosis. And we'll get to two tests here. It says two tests used to diagnose conductive deafness are the Weber and Riney test. In the Weber test, it says the handle of a vibrating tuning fork is pressed against the forehead. 
A normal person's hearing perceives the sound is coming from directly in front. If, in fact, sound conduction is blocked in one of those, the sound may begin to, of course, appear to be coming from that impaired sound. Side, I'm sorry, that impaired side. That impaired side. I'm mentioning this because we'll do these diagnostic tests in the lab. The second is a Rennie test. So the vibrating tongue and fork is held against the bone behind the ear. After the sound is no longer heard by conduction through the bones of the skull, the fork is removed to just in front of the ear, the external acoustic meatus. In the middle ear, conductive deafness, the vibrating tongue and fork can only be heard. But over here, we'll continue to hear its tone. Please take care of yours. I would hate for you all to uh, be without it. So I'll jump on down to where it gets to hearing loss and signs of such. Difficulty hearing people talking softly. An inability to understand speech when there is no background noise. Ringing or a sensation of fullness in the ears. Loss of balance, yes. Dizziness, yes. And it also mentions difficulty distinguishing high-pitched sounds from each other. And even the need to turn up the volume on the TV or your phone. So a new parent, as you all may be already or may be in the future, it states, they should notice whether their infant responds to sounds in a way that indicates normal hearing. Hearing exams are a part of the, bill, the will baby visit to a doctor and even what occurs at the hospital right after birth. If the baby's response is, of course, one that indicates a possible problem, the next step would be, of course, to see an audiologist who will identify measures of hearing loss. Well, identify and measure the hearing loss. I just can't stress enough, class. Please take care of your ears. So let's get now to the sense of equilibrium. There's two derived senses. That is called static equilibrium, and that is the dynamic equilibrium. As I've mentioned both, let's keep going. So static equilibrium refers to that position of the head when the body is not moving. So, position of the head when the body is not moving. And those receptors are found in the vestibule of the inner ear. So, in the vestibule of the inner ear is where this occurs, as opposed to with dynamic equilibrium. So, dynamic equilibrium senses rotation and movement of the, of the head and body by way of those receptors found in the semicircular canals. The semicircular canals. So as it states, we have different sensory organs to provide those two components of equilibrium. The organs associated with static equilibrium sense the position of the head and maintain the stability and posture when the body and head are still. So when the head and body suddenly move rotate, these organs of dynamic equilibrium detect the motion and aid in maintaining balance. That way you just don't fall over. So to static equilibrium. So the organs here, as I mentioned earlier, is including the vestibule. So that vestibule is that bony chamber between our semicircular canals and the cochlea. So it has those membranous labyrinths inside, and the vestibule consists of two chambers called the utricle and the sacule. Let's get to how it happens. So we have support cells meaning the utricle and saccule, each has a small patch of hair cells and supporting cells called a macula on the wall. I mentioned the maculae, which is plural for macula, because they are a sensory receptor organ that monitor the position of the head in space. By doing such, they play a key role in controlling posture, and they respond to linear acceleration, changes that are straight, Changes to a straight line speed and direction, but nothing to do with rotation. So in the saccule, the macula is nearly vertical, and the hairs protrude horizontally into the otolith membrane. So what I'm getting to here is, in addition, we have the kynocilium, and that's the tallest stereocilia. And what I'm getting at here is, we have stereocilia here in the vestibule, with these vestibular hairs. So we have support cells around those that are scattered with hairs, 
and the hairs of the hair cells are embedded into the overlying otolith membrane. So it's a jelly-like mass set with tiny stones made of calcium carbonate crystals called otoliths. So the otoliths are small, and they are dense, and they increase as the membrane's weight, and inertia, meaning to resist changes in motion. So as this does happen, it says when the head is upright, those hairs of the macula in the utricle project vertically, and those in the sacule project horizontally, in both of which the hairs are here in contact with the otolith membrane. So by adding that weight, it's more responsive to changes in motion. And the hair cells, which are sensory receptors, have dendrites and sensor neurons that are wrapped around the bases. So these neurons are associated with the vestibular portion of that vestibular cochlear nerve. So I believe what I'll do is I'll pause the lecture here, and then we'll pick up next time with the way in which equilibrium continues to occur. I'll say it this way. Please listen to this lecture and take notes. That way the lecture makes more sense than it may have been the first time. And once we finish this next time, we'll then get directly into the sense of sight. The sense of sight. Thank you all for listening, class. Take care of yourselves and study well.